So, <clears throat> I want to say a word about why people play games. You know, why would anybody in their right mind <laughs> want to set themselves up to feel bad? Well, uh, the problem is they're not in their uh, conscious mind, <laughs> in their adult. Um, they, you know, first of all, Games satisfy all the basic psychological hungers. That they're a substitute way of getting what we may not be getting directly. They involve very intense negative strokes. They structure time in a very dramatic and exciting way. And they justify one's basic existential life position. And justify the script. And our child has an investment in the script because, again, it's a magical way to try to get unconditional love and acceptance. To get what we didn't get and felt like we should have gotten as a kid. Any questions about that? Yes. Do um, do games ever involve positive strokes? Well, <clears throat> the answer, the brief answer, is no. Uh, Eric Byrne had to include positive games in his book, Games People Play because the publisher refused to publish anything that was totally negative. So he made up some stuff. <laughs> uh, but they're really not techli technically games because there's not any switch. And by definition, games have to have a switch to be a game. What do you mean by that? Um, there's some surprise switch. You know, you're expecting one thing and something else happens. And that's why people take negative strokes from games. But the games he described basically were uh, situations in which uh, there was no switch. People ended up feeling good, but it wasn't technically a game by the definition of, you know, the TA definition of games. So how do you help people go about changing their life script? Well, Eric Burns' answer was, you start by analyzing their ego states, going through structural analysis, and then you help them look at their transactions with other people through transactional analysis proper. And then you help them bring into awareness the games and rackets that they tend to use. And then you finally help them go through a life script analysis to, in order to bring it into awareness and to make other choices. Bob and Mary Goulding's view is that it is the early decision that's really the linchpin of the script. The child's decision is what holds the script together. So if you help the person go back to and identify the early decision and change that, the script falls apart. They no longer need to do play the rackets and games and so forth. They don't have any investment in that. So it's a much briefer process in terms of helping, helping people move out of their script. And that's what redecision therapy is all about. <coughs> Right. It, it, it uses gestalt experiential techniques uh, to help people do that. The overall goal of TA therapy is to help individuals experience themselves as okay, as having worth, value, and dignity as human beings, to take back the power and autonomy they had to give up in childhood, to regain or recover their spontaneity, 
to feel safe in being intimate with others and create the kind of life they want for themselves in the present. So Byrne defined autonomy as the attainment of three capacities. Awareness, spontaneity, and the capacity for intimacy. So as we bring into awareness our life script, if we discover we've been living out a tragedy, we can change to a comedy or an adventure story. You know, we can put a different show on the road and have a different life. Now, TA is a contractual form of therapy. You know, if we go back to the basic philosophical pr principles that everybody has the capacity to think, then uh, it's not up to the therapist to decide what is best for the client. It's up to the client to decide what he or she wants for their own life. And for the therapist to, um, if that um, outcome fits with the, with the therapist's values and ethics, and then he or she uh, enters into a contract, an agreement, to help the person achieve that. Um, an ethical therapist would not contract with somebody to become a be better bank robber, for example. Or something that, you know, was uh, a, unlawful, uh, other things that were unlawful or against the, the therapist's ethics or values. So contracts are a mutual agreement by both parties. The simplest definition is a mutual agreement regarding a well-defined outcome. That was Byrne's simple definition for a contract. Contracts basically define who both people are, what it is they're going to do together, what the outcome of that process will be, and how they will both know when they get there in terms of specific behavior and how that contract will be beneficial or pleasing to the client. <clears throat> Byrne used to talk about the difference between hard contracts and soft contracts. Hard contracts are very behaviorally specific. I want to make three new friends a week. Uh, that's very measurable. You can tell that the person is doing that. And it makes the contract much more attainable by having a clear, specific goal. Soft contracts are very general and nonspecific. Like, I want to feel better. That's difficult to measure. So more, the more the contract is specified in actual observable behavior, the easier it will be to attain. Uh, Byrne used to joke that if he got on an airplane in San Francisco and the pilot said, we're going <coughs> toward New York, he would get off. <coughs> he said at the beginning of a journey... He wanted to know exactly where he was going to end up. And he said, therapy should be no different. Contracts really make the therapeutic process or the consulting process um, a mutually cooperative venture on the part of the therapist or consultant or client. Contracts also cut through psychological games by making things explicit up front. So they're not different assumptions about what the outcome is going to be. Uh, Claude Steiner pointed out that contracts involve four basic elements. 
like all good legal contracts and other contracts, there is first of all mutual consent. Both parties are agreeing to what they're contracting for. Second, there's valid consideration. Uh, what that usually means is the therapist or consultant is making their time available and the client is going to remunerate them, going to pay them for their time. So it's not a rescue operation. The third element is competency. The client is competent to undergo the kind of treatment that the therapist has to offer. And the therapist is competent to uh, deliver the kind of treatment the client is requesting. If not, they refer the client to someone else. The fourth element is a lawful ethical object. We're agreeing to do something that fits with both our ethical systems and, and is within the law. <clears throat> Mural James suggests five basic questions that are very useful in contracting, and I add one more to that list, uh, which I'll share with you. The first question is, what could you change about your life that would really enhance your life? What could you change about yourself that would really enhance your life? Second, what would you need to do in order to accomplish that? What action would you need to take? Third, how would that be beneficial or pleasing to you? If it's not beneficial or pleasing to the person's child ego state, they're not going to do it. Because it is really the child, the natural child, who's going to make it happen or not making it happen. The power and creativity and energy for change is in that natural child. So any battle between the parent and the child, the child's always going to win out. Because the child is the original part of us. Fourth question, how would you and I no both know once you had accomplished that? That is, what would we see in terms of actual behavior, specific behavior to let us know that, yep, you've made that change? The fifth element or question is, how could you sabotage that? How could you prevent yourself from making that change? It's a way of bringing into awareness the unconscious motivations. And people know if you ask them. So it heads the person off at the pass rather than, you know, create some dysfunctional behavior that's going to lead them to not make the change. By bringing it into awareness, then they can make a conscious choice about that. So the sixth question I add is, what will you do instead? in order to get what you want. Instead of sabotaging, what will you do instead to get what you want? Yes. If the person says, the way I could sabotage is not coming to sessions. So what will you do instead? I'll come weekly. Or the person might say, uh, the way I could sabotage is to keep believing that I'm worthless and inviting people to overlook me. So what will you do instead in order to get what you want? Uh, I'll ask directly for what I want, and so I get my needs met. Any questions about any parts of that? Yes. The second item. No. Second example you just gave us. Right. Oh. Uh, you were, yes. Uh, the person might say, the way I could sabotage myself 
is to continue to believe that I'm not worthwhile or important and invite people to overlook me. And if you ask what we do instead, they might say, I'll ask directly for things that I want from people. It almost seems like a cycle then, because then um, what will you do instead? It almost brings me back to um, another contract. Yes, or it's just making explicit a particular item in the contract. Contracts are always subject to renegotiation by either party. As you work with somebody over time, new information comes into awareness. Like you might uncover that the person has a don't be injunction and they've been suicidal. And then you contract with them to close that escape hatch. To eliminate that as an option. Or the client might become aware of something new that they want to do. So contracting is an ongoing process. Whenever you don't know where to go next, you need to get information from the client about where they want to go. So I want to give you a transactional view of contrast of contracting versus what getting into a game looks like. So if this is the client and this is the therapist, one of the most common games in therapy is a game called Do Me Something. Where the client comes in and says, I've got this terrible problem. I don't know what to do about it. You've got to help me, Doc. <laughs> and if the therapist is not aware of how the person is discounting their thinking and responsibility, they might say back, or the, client, the secret message that the client is sending is, you take responsibility for this problem and you think and figure out what to do and tell me. And if the therapist is not aware of those discounts, the therapist might say, well, why don't you do such and such? And the psychological me level message is, okay, I'll take responsibility, I'll think and tell you what to do. And Initially, the client will feel very grateful. Uh, but part of their child will begin to resent the fact that they're being told what to do. So they may come back in a few weeks and tell the therapist how his advice totally messed up their life. And now it's the therapist's responsibility. You told me to do this. To which the therapist responds meekly, I was only trying to help you. So do me something and I was only trying to help you are comp examples of complimentary games. It's one of the most common games in therapy. Where the client tries to get the therapist to take responsibility and solve the problem for them or tell them what to do or whatever. So that the client is not responsible for the outcome. And the therapist gets to feel inadequate. So the way to avoid that is through contracting. So the therapist, I mean the client comes in and says, I've got this terrible problem. <clears throat> I don't know what to do about it. You've got to help me. And the therapist says, what would you like to do about that? Well, I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't be here. You're the therapist. 
that's true, and I'm willing to think and problem solve with you, but I'm not willing to discount you by treating you as though you can't think. Oh, okay. So the therapist then gets information about what the person wants from their child, what they see as beneficial from their parent, and then contracts with them for that change. In that relationship, the therapist is not taking responsibility. It is a joint venture, and both parties have responsibility. And they're much more likely to have a positive outcome when they're both working together in a collaborative way. Any questions about that? Okay, I'd like for you to choose a partner and just sit facing each other and go through those six questions with the other person to practice this. Has, every, <clears throat> has everybody had a t chance to do a contract both ways? Okay, how about we come back together? And anyone have questions or comments about that process? Did you find those questions useful? Good. It's really tough to, uh, it's easier to be on the soft side, I guess. Right. Yeah, you have to really continue to ask questions to get the specifics often. Yeah. All right, so um, let me get my slide up. Um, I want to um, talk about a couple of models for pulling all of this information together that we covered in the last two days. It's a lot of information and it will probably take a while to integrate all of this. But um, there are a couple of um, overviews to kind of make sense out of how all of it um, comes together. Uh, one is a <clears throat> diagram that was an, uh, originally uh, drawn out by Bill Holloway, who was one of the former past presidents of ITAA. And he pointed out at birth, um, our basic life position is, I'm okay and you're okay. I have worth, value, and dignity. You have worth, value, and dignity. That's the reality. And then we encounter parents who um, give out certain injunctions when they feel threatened of certain behavior on our part. And those injunctions lead to a decision or decisions about I and or you are not okay in some way. And then we often feel bad when we think that, and that often becomes our racket. And in order to keep that racket going, we often will play a certain game or games to justify feeling that way. And in that process, we collect what Eric Byrne talked about as trading stamps. He was developing this theory back in the 1950s when people used to save up uh, s &H green stamps and gold bond stamps and so forth that you would get from various merchants and you would paste them in a book and as soon as you got several books you could cash them in for a certain prize. And he said, you know, people do the same thing with feelings. If uh, somebody does something that is hurtful, I may not say anything and I just place a hurt stamp in my book. And after I've collected 500 books, I might feel justified in a guilt-free suicide. Or 
people collect anger stamps. And after they've gotten a certain number of books of anger stamps, then they, the least little thing the next person does, they feel justified in hauling off and punching them. Or whatever. Uh, and he said, people who feel okay don't need to collect stamps. We collect stamps when we don't feel okay in some way, and we have to feel like we've got to justify our feelings and behavior. But those stamps are collected for the ultimate script payoff. And those are things like, maybe like homicide, suicide, running away, going crazy. You know, some often as a child, we have the fantasy that if we take some extreme action, then surely our parents or whoever will change and treat us differently. And that is what the script is all about, that whole process. And it begins with the child's decision. So the only way out of the script is exactly the way the person came into the script is by making a new decision, which is called a redecision. To really re, uh, reclaim our own okayness and uh, validate other people as okay. Since that's the only thing that's really based on reality. The rest of it is mythology. Things that felt true when we didn't have all the information. And the redecision is made by the same part of the person who made the original decision which is the child ego state, with the help of adult information that we have now that we didn't have as a little kid. And also the ability to nurture and take care of ourselves. Any questions about that? By, by, by the uh, child, is this the natural child? The, uh... Yes the natural or free child, which is the source of our energy and creativity. It's the original part of us. And what that involves often is going back to the original experience and reworking that emotionally so that we bring into awareness the kinds of things that we did not perceive or were not capable of understanding originally. And also you can set up dialogues uh, have have the conversation with mom or dad now that you weren't capable of having at two or three. And get the information and tell them what you uh, wanted to tell them that you couldn't tell them then and talk out and uh, problem solve that original situation. So rather than running away, I can talk with my parents and ask them for what I want or whatever or find out the missing information. Another uh, framework that I find very useful is one that Martin Groter, who was also a teaching member of ITAA who died a few years ago from cancer, uh, talked about uh, he talks about the difference between hope and courage. And what he pointed out was that hope uh, is often held out for uh, getting it all, getting 100% of what we want, living happily ever after, having a perfect life. You know, whatever our fantasy was as a, as a young child. And the reality is that getting 100% is impossible. You know, most of us had the, the fantasy as a little kid is, is if we just figured it all out or did it perfectly or whatever, it would all be perfect. We'd get everything we wanted. Live happily ever after. Be loved unconditionally for the rest of our lives and never have any problems. After all, that's what fairy tales teach. 
And there are active forms of hope. And there are passive forms of hope. The active forms of hope are searching, you know, for the right man or the right woman who's going to make my life complete, or the right guru who's going to give me all the answers, or whatever. Another active form of hope is pretending. You know, maybe if I just pretend everything is wonderful long enough, then one day it will be. Uh, the popular version of that is fake it till you make it. Another active form of hope is called monomania. Um, you know, being manic about finding the answer, the truth, um, the one thing that's going to make it all right. And then there are passive forms of hope, like waiting. It's like waiting for a bus, um, or, um, you know, sometimes we feel like, well, I know he really loves me, and if I just wait long enough, one of these days he will confirm that, or she will confirm that, or whatever. If I just wait long enough, it will all be different. Byrne used to talk about how people wait for Santa Claus only to find out in the end that it's rigor mortis that shows up. And then the ultimate passive form of, of uh, hope is giving up. And that's like, uh, you know, when you wait for a bus that hasn't arrived and you know the minute you walk away it's going to be there, right? So the person will do this. I go. You know, it's a magical way of making that bus show up. I give up. Uh, the bad news is there is no 100%, but there is about 98%, which is pretty darn good. And... Uh, What's important is to have the, the courage to go ahead and live in an imperfect world where you can't get 100%, but you can get 90, about 98%, um, which is pretty good. The alternative to searching is exploring to find out what is possible. The alternative to pretending is being real. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable, to be open and honest, and to be willing to risk that. The alternative to monomania is enthusiasm and commitment for what is possible. Even though it will never be perfect, it can be pretty exciting. The alternative to waiting is having patience. Because some people in some situations and so forth uh, are going to require time to work things out with. The change often in terms of getting what we want is not likely to be instantaneous. So often it requires some patience on our part and willingness to hang in there and work it out. The alternative to giving up is letting go. Because there's some people in situations that are simply not going to change. And instead of continuing to struggle or try hard, it's important to release them and let that go. And move on in your life. So I found that a very helpful framework in terms of understanding the difference between hope and courage. Hope leads people to hold out for the magical script cure, you know, um, to, to get, a, get 100%, which is really impossible. And it's important to be willing to have the courage to go ahead and live in an imperfect world where things are possible and can be pretty fulfilling and exciting. Any questions or comments?
about those two frames of a reference? It's called living in reality versus magic. So I want to say a word about where to get more information beyond this course. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ian Stewart and I wrote a book called TA Today, A New Introduction to Transactional Analysis, which is now in its uh, second edition. The original one was written in 87. Um, the new one was written uh, just a few years ago. And it, and it and contains um, updated information and some expanded information uh, on personality adaptations and other things, relational therapy, that were not uh, yet developed at the time we wrote the book, the first edition. Uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, we also have a certification training program uh, at our institute in Chapel Hill, and I also do one in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, <coughs> There are other training programs around the country. Um, there are not as many as there used to be in the United States. Um, are there other people here who have training programs that you're currently running? Are you doing any training? Okay. You are, Joan? Yeah. Good. So there's online training available as well as training at um, our institute and um, so I invite you to uh, come to additional workshops um, you will see a lot of neat presentations here at the conference if you're staying for the conference and uh, I hope this information will be as useful to you as it has to me in my own life and work I really appreciate your time and attention and interest and participation and um, if you will, again, fill out the evaluation forms for the continuing education credits. And uh, when you sign the video release, uh, Teresa will, uh, Tessa, I'm sorry, Tessa will give you your certificate. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.